And I do want to read to you hearing verses 33 through the first part of 39. If you have that, would you stand on your feet in reverence to the reading of God's word? John chapter number 11. And go ahead and keep your uh, marker in John chapter 11 because we'll conclude there this three part series, I believe, on next week. God's will. John chapter number 11, verse 33. Amen. Amen. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, she came with her, he groaned in the spirit, he was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Verse number 35, the, ver the first verse that I, I placed in my memory bank. And the, the verse, if you don't know a verse in the Bible, you should know this. John chapter 11, verse number 35, Jesus wept. If you don't know a scripture, you should know that one. Hide it in your heart. Meditate on it day and night. Somebody asks you, you know any scripture, you tell them, yes, I know John 11 and 35. Jesus will. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. 37. And some of them said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died. Jesus said, Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. And it was a cave, a stone laid upon it. This is where I'll finish the eighth part of 39. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Take away the stone. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord as today. I want to use as a topic, it's about to happen. It's about to happen. And, and, and if I need a co-topic, put this in parentheses, Selena, when you post this, move the stone. It's about to happen. Move the stone. Let us do our sermonic prayer. Father, please bless the preaching and the preaching of your word. Bless me to hear you and grow in Christ. As a result of receiving your word. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Usher, you may retire. Let's give Sister Lucy a round of applause. <laughs> Hallelujah. She told me, Brother Jeff, at the work today, she stood in for me. And, and, and that's the spirit that we need here in the Silly Chapel. People who are ready to step up, step in, and, and do the job. Amen. Amen. And God bless you, Sister Lucy. Uh, I see Sister Lucy all the time coming in or out of eating, and I throw my hand up. I think it'd be a little too late. <laughs> she looked like, I don't see you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's always good to see all of you. Uh, I used to see Sister Linda and Dottie at Walmart. I think they hot. They know my schedule now, so they go at a different time. But I'm going I'm I'm to flip it up, and I'm going to start beating y'all again. <laughs> It's, it's, it's about to happen. Understand, I didn't say something is about to happen because when I say it instead of something, something leads to uh, randomness. Mm -hmm. And we don't serve a God of randomness. And if you understand the text and the scripture, we most of us know that this is where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus did not leave and go to the place where Lazarus was for some random act mm -hmm. to take place. He knew specifically where he was going, why he was going, and what was going to happen. Jesus had more expectation in himself and in his father's business than the people had that were there with him. Church, if we could raise our level of expectation to meet the expectations of what God has in store for us, it would save us a lot of anxiety, heartache, and pain. 
I think somebody needs an example. When you when you pray to God, you need to expect him to do exactly what he said he would do. You, you need to start expecting God to move on your behalf. Now, that's not being cocky or arrogant. That's having confidence in the one who created everything. As I said on, yesterday, on last week, God works from the end to the beginning. God knows how things are going to end before they get started. Uh, the Bible says, I know the thoughts that I have for you, and they are thoughts of peace and not of evil to get you to an expected, there goes that word again, to an expected end. God expects great things for you. God expects happiness and wealth for you. Even Paul even prayed above all things. Uh, I pray that you will prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That is the expectation that God has for you in your life. He's expecting you to be healthy. He's expecting you to be wealthy. He's expecting good things to happen. Oh, I'm talking to the wrong church in here on today. So if you're going to believe God, you have to match that belief with expectations that in the end, everything is going to be all right. Give, give me a scripture, Pastor Romans, in chapter number eight. It says, all things work together for them that love him uh huh, and, and are called according to his purpose. Amen. Let, let's, let's don't just stop at all things work together. You, gotta be, you have to be called according to his purpose. So if you are living willy-nilly and doing everything you want to do under the sun, you are not acting as if you are called because when you are called, you are drawn out. That's what called is. You are drawn out from the world. You're no longer uh, of the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world because you have been called. I gave the perfect analogy. I don't know why old, old sermons keep coming back into my mind, but I gave the perfect analogy some years ago when we were talking about the NFL. And, and when training camp starts, and, and I, was, I was talking about many are called, but few are chosen. Mm -hmm. And I said, when training camp start, oh, you might have 150, 60 players running around on the field jockeying for a position. You were called. But on a certain date during the season, your roster has to be sliced down to 53 players. Not 54, not 52, 53 players. Those 53 players were not only called, but they were also chosen. Church, I came to tell somebody in here today, listening to the testimonies and seeing the prayers being answered, not only were we called Assembly Chapel, but God is now choosing you to be a representative on how good he can be in this earth. That's, that's what the scripture is talking about. God didn't raise Lazarus just so he could walk around. He raised Lazarus so the people around him could see the glory of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't mind one bit if God chooses me to show off his glory to the non-believer. How is King surviving, making the money he may have? Is he having the things that he have with, with, the, with the financial condition he's in? How is are things going well? How is he standing upright and his glucose is all out of whack? Because God chose me to show everybody else that he is a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of patience, and the God of glory. Amen. Oh, somebody shout glory. glory. Am I making sense so far? Amen. And so, and so, I, gotta, I, have, a, I have a double intro today. This is my second intro. A sister, and I have two beautiful sisters. Beautiful. Now growing up, I used to tell them they stink and <laughs> talk about how they look. I used to do all that stuff growing up. But as an adult, I realized I have two beautiful sisters. I didn't say pretty. They are pretty, don't get me wrong. But I, when I say beautiful, I don't use that word loosely. 
Because beauty is inside first. Amen. You, you, can, you can look pretty and not be beautiful. I have two beautiful sisters. And the oldest one celebrated her birthday on yesterday. And we went out. And, 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 and I'm talking about removing the stone right now. I want to go from, 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 the, from, the, from the last verse I read. And then I'm going to go back to the beginning. And now I'll fill it out. Amen? Amen. So stick with me. Because Jesus said, take away the stone. There's something between you and your freedom that God wants removed. Now understand, Jesus in all of his power could have just pointed to the stone or assigned angels and the rock would have rolled back. Understand? But Jesus gave the instructions to the people to take away the stone. And what God told me to tell you, and I'm going to tell the story, but what God told me to tell you is, and I'm hard on friendship circles, right? Because a lot of us are carrying dead weight. So I want you to ask yourself, who in my circle would be willing to help me roll away the stone? We was at her party or dinner over at the Red Lobster in Burlington. And it was a table full of family. And it was this other one lady that was not family, according to what, uh, 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 you know, ge 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 what's the word? Come on. That word, genealogy. And so after we sung happy birthday to Wendy, and of course we had to do uh, the regular version, and we had to soup it up and do the Stevie Wonder version or whoever it was. And, and Trey A sang so long, I was so embarrassed. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I was so embarrassed. And um, I finally did the little choir thing. I said, like, we ain't at the house, y'all. <laughs> Bring it in. Yeah, just draw it back. And, and, and after they sang, you know, I'm, I'm a jokester, and I made a little joke, and I didn't mean to say it so loud, but I said, look at Wendy, celebrate with all her family and her one friend. She has, she's got a, a good friend named Desiree. And Desi has been really good friends with Wendy for as long as I can remember. And as I made the joke, I was thinking about it this morning because everybody was laughing. She was laughing. Desi was laughing. This morning, when I was, when I was going over the sermon notes, like I said, I don't use notes in the pulpit, but don't think I don't study and use notes. And I was thinking about that rolling away the stone. And even though I believe Wendy's got one good friend, I will guarantee you that if she needed somebody, that she could call on that one good friend. And I bet you she would be there to help roll away her stone. And so I said that with the intentions of telling you that you need to check your friend base. Because the problem is, many of us are spending all of our energy, all of our time, helping other people roll away their stones. But after they roll away their stones, after they get away from their distractions, after they are freed from their hindrance with everything that you had to help them with, they move on. Never come back to check on you. Never come back to see how you're doing. Never come back to see if there's a stone blocking your path from your freedom, from your blessings to come. But every now and then they may say, hmm, I wonder what Melita is doing. Remember back in 23, she helped me out tremendously. But they never reach out to you because their stone has been removed. And they're not concerned about yours. So you need, you, need, you, need to, you need to check your circle. Again, I don't know why God keeps telling me to say this over and over and over again. But you need to check that circle of friends and people and even family. To see if they're just around you for what you can do for them. Because you see, a friendship needs to be a two-way street. It must go both ways. 
That's why you're sitting somewhere cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs losing your mind because you gave all of your mental energy helping somebody else that's not in turn going to help you. That's why you feel like you can't love again because you put all of your energy in loving somebody or something that's not going to love you in return. Let me, let, me, let me slap this in the mouth. That's why you're saying that you won't love a church again because that church that you put all of your energy in was not preaching the gospel, was not caring for you, was not comforting you, was not, was not, was not helping you grow in the spirit. And you were putting all your time and energy in that church and you weren't getting anything out. And you're blaming it on church hurt. It's not church hurt. But you, you, you put all you had into something that was not pouring back into you. That's why I love Assembly Chapel, because this place is so full of love. If you leave Assembly Chapel and you don't feel the love, it's not our fault, it's yours. Amen. From talk to text. So we can move out of here. We already know that Jesus has received the news. That the one he loved has died. Mm -hmm. Martha meets him and she says, you've been here. He'd still be living. Jesus explains to her. He says that he will live again. Paraphrasing the text. And she says, yes, God, I know, Lord Jesus, that, that, that he'll be resurrected in the last day. I understand that. And I love what Jesus said to her and he makes it plain. He says, he says, I am the resurrection mm -hmm. that that day that you are looking for is here right now. Mm -hmm. do, do you understand that somebody in here is waiting for something that you loved so much in your life that that, that you know that it is good for you to have and, and you're waiting for it, knowing that it's going to come back to life. All you have to do is place yourself in Christ Jesus, amen, because he is the resurrection. So I need to explain to somebody that the things that you are waiting to happen in your life that you know God told you was going to happen. I'm getting excited a little bit. You know God said it was going to happen. You know that it is in his will, but you're waiting on why and when it's going to happen. It's going to happen, but you you're having to wait because you're trying to make things happen in your timing when God is eternal. You don't rush God. You cannot carry God. God will be there on time. God will do it when he said he was going to do it. How he said he was going to do it. Stop worrying about when it's going to come to life. Just make sure you're serving God because Jesus is the resurrection. Yes. Amen. He's going to resurrect everything that you feel like has died in your life. God is going to bring it back when he gets ready. I've, I've been saying this for the last 12, 13 years. Why is he going to trust you with something that you can't manage? Why is God going to trust you with something that you cannot manage? Y'all want an example? I've been using the same example 12 years and it still holds true. Why? Why, 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 why? Would God grace you with a million dollars if you can't manage 10? If you, if, you, if you can blow $10 and not even know what you did with it, why is he going to trust you with that much money? Why is he going to trust you with healing of diabetes when all you're going to do is turn around and eat cupcakes all day? Why is he going to trust you with the healing of blood pressure when you're going to suck on ham bones all day? You have to, you need to show God, prove to him that you are ready for the miracle. I understand the topic says something I mean, it, it, I'm sorry, I, I contradicted myself. It is about to happen. And I'm using the story to illustrate. And so Jesus told her, I am the resurrection. 
And he comes to her in verse 33. And it says, when Jesus, therefore, saw her and the Jews weeping. Last week, I told you that it was a group of Jews that followed Martha and Mary to the tomb because they wanted to go and weep for her. And let's talk about this circle of friends again. I know I understand the Bible says rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. But but sometimes they, we need strength from our supporting group. Amen. When I was in pastor's training, I've been in preacher's training, but when Dr. Woodson put me in pastor's training to come here and do the best job that I could do, he told me one thing. He says, you have to prepare yourself for the worst when going to visit hospitals and families of the bereaved. And I need to ask the question of anybody in here that I've visited during the hour of bereavement. How would you have felt if I had walked in the house hollering and crying louder than anybody else. You would be thinking, why in the world did we call him down here? And he's making the situation even worse than it was before. There was a group of people who did not go with Martha and Mary to increase the situation or be with support, but they went down there to make more noise than, they, than she was. And I understand that in these, in these times that it showed honor and respect. The louder you wept, the louder you were weeping, the more you showed you cared for the person. But let's look at the difference in tradition and Jesus. Because weeping and wept in Greek means two different things. Weeping is the out loud crying and the yelling and the sobbing. Wept, what's our memory scripture? Jesus. Wept mean he silently had emotions. So Jesus didn't go to the tomb hollering, weeping, and wailing. Like Mahalia Jackson said, no more weeping and wailing. He didn't go to the tomb to look like everybody else. Jesus went to the tomb with a different idea. I said that to say this. It doesn't matter how your friends are accepting what you're doing because they are only conforming to the way you're acting towards your situation. That's why it's so important to call on a man named Jesus who can come and make a difference in your life. Sometimes you go to your prayer partners, but they're just conforming to the emotions that you have. If you want to cry, I'm going to cry. If you want to start cussing, I'll start cussing. If you're ready to go fire some shots, I'm ready to go fire some shots. But I need to call on somebody who's going to have some reason in the situation. I need to call on somebody who's going to calm me down. I need to call on somebody who's going to relax the situation and make some changes. I need to change your mind. I need to change your heart. So I'll call on Jesus. Yeah. The Bible says when he saw all the others weeping that came with her, he got upset. Now we're talking about a myriad of emotions in these few chapters, in these few verses. We're looking at, at weeping. We're looking about when Jesus wept. But we're also looking about when Jesus got a little frustrated. And I'll set myself down on this one because I want you to think about it. We all love to think about Jesus and his love and his care, his grace, his mercy, and all of that is good. But in the Bible, it teaches us when Jesus groaned in his spirit that he began frustrated. The word groan means, uh, it, it's like, uh, I saw it somewhere, I can't remember, but it meant a righteous anger. A righteous anger. What does that mean? That means when you, when you, when you get angry, but you sin not. Mm -hmm. Jesus is showing us how to deal with our anger. I've never seen that in the text, but he's teaching us because Jesus, whatever God does, if you don't remember anything else, whatever God does is the standard for those that believe in him. Does that make sense? Amen. The way God loves in the Bible is the standard on the way we should love everybody else. Amen. The, way, the way God shows grace in the Bible, the way he shows mercy in the Bible, the way he's patient and, and slow to anger 
and, and quick to reconcile. These are the standards for us that believe. Am I making sense here? Just clap your hands, blink, do something. That is the standard of our behavior. So let's look and see what happens when Jesus groaned in his spirit. First of all, Jesus groaned in his spirit because he already told them that Lazarus was going to come back when he said, I'm the resurrection. So why are you sitting here weeping and crying when he already told you that it is about to happen? That is just like you praying to God for whatever it is you are praying for and the preacher came up and told you prophetically that it is about to happen and you go home crying, weeping, and well in any way. Why would you cry when you already know that you are about to get your breakthrough? Why would you sit there and cry over spilled milk when God said wipe it up and keep moving? Why would you go into your doldrums, go into the valley, get depressed over a situation when God already said it is about to happen and everything is going to be all right? I came to talk to somebody who's been praying for something in the spirit that's going to turn your whole world around. That's the reason we pray, for God to interrupt the path of life. If you're sick, you're praying for a healing. You don't want to continue to be sick. You want God to interrupt the course that you're traveling in. And so he goes. Let me, let me, let me finish because I'm going I'm to slip into part three and I don't want to do that because I want you to come back next week. Okay. But, but, but he says here, he groaned in the spirit. And when you study and look that up, actually, in Greek, it means the sound of a horse snorting. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Jesus came, and I told you he had expectations of showing the glory of God in this situation. But the people don't believe. So I'm led to believe, and you think what you want to think through your research, but I'm led to believe that Jesus got frustrated at the lack of faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And Jesus is seeing that the people don't have faith in what he has already told them. He, and, and that shows because they're sitting here crying and weeping over something that Jesus has already told them that is almost is about to happen. And so when he see the weeping, Studying, Jesus said, oh. that's, that's the noise of a horse. He's frustrated. Look, how would you feel if you told somebody and you knew you had the power to do it? Let's go back to money because we all relate to money. Sister Cusella, richest woman in the room, and she told me <laughs> that, 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 you know, I'm in a bind, Sister Cusella. I need about 100 grand. I need 100 stack. I'm in a bind. And Sister Cusella says, I got you. Call who? <laughs> and she tells me, I got you. But when it's about to happen, and she comes with what I asked for, and I'm crying because I didn't believe that she was going to come through. This is what Jesus is feeling. You prayed for it. You came and got me. You delivered the news so I could come. And regardless of what it looks like, because you know we walk by faith, not by sight. See, you're looking at a body in a tomb instead of looking at God who is the resurrection. And so when he gets there, you're crying. And Jesus is may maybe if I can use my, 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 my sanctified imagination, Jesus is probably saying, why are you crying when I already told you that I am the resurrection and the resurrection is here? <sighs> <laughs> but he got angry and didn't sin. The standard of getting angry. You see, we, we, like I said, we look at God in totality. And whatever he does is the standard and the way we should behave. We can get angry, but the standard is to stay holy. 
The standard is to be holy because God is holy. So Jesus is here groaning in his spirit. And, and then he says he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't chastise them. He didn't say anything bad to them. Didn't make them feel bad. I can see Jesus in the spirit angry, frustrated, with indignation, grunting into, unto himself. And then he says, you know what? Where are you laying? I'm getting tired of all this crying. I'm upset because you did not believe. Even though you said, yea, Lord, you still did not believe. Blessings are reserved to them that believe. Do you know that? So he's frustrated. He says, you know what? Forget all of this. Just show me where you lay it. And they said, come, Lord. And then what? Jesus did what? Memory verse. He wept. Silently. Because this was still a person he loves. Understand, when you hurt, he feels your emotions. Mm -hmm. Now, the Greek, the, the Jews in these days, and the Greeks felt like God was an emotionless God. And, and they believed and taught that God did not feel pain. And, and really, to say that, didn't care about what the people went through as long as they belonged to him. That is not true. God feels your pain. God, as we see in the scripture, he is involved in our emotions. When we're happy, I think it makes God happy. When we go through, I feel like God shares an experience in our pain and in our grief. And the Bible says Jesus wept. I don't think he was just weeping over Lazarus. Because why would he be weep over Lazarus? If he knew that he was about to raise him from the dead, he was weeping and he wept because of the people around him who thought they had lost a brother. You see, so God, Jesus gets over the anger. Understand this point, And I'm going to sit down. Probably he gets over the anger and continues on with his father's business, caring for people. Amen. That is our problem in the church. When we get mad, we want to stay mad for a long time. We want to hold grudges against one another. Not here, but in some churches, people can't even sit beside each other because of what their grandmama's grandmama did to somebody else's grandmama grandma. Hatfields and McCoy type situation. Hatfields and McCoys don't even know why today they don't like each other. They were just bred and trained not to like each other. It's a shame, but it's the same way in the church. Somebody's grandma didn't like their grandma and they don't even know what the situation was, but I don't like you because my family was born and bred not to like your family, but we can't let the, the brother they love go around in the church like the Bible says because of traditions. Because of things that happened way before we were born and don't know anything about. And so Jesus goes on to be about his father's business, cares for the people, and then uh, some of the people are saying, and this makes this upsets them again. Some of the people are saying in, in verse 37, and some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused even this man to uh, should not have died? They're not making a mockery of Jesus, but they're saying that they realize the power of Jesus. They've heard about his healing of the blind. They know about him causing uh, the deaf to hear. They know that he caused the lame to walk. And they ask the question, man, if he could have been here, Lazarus would not have died. What was Jesus' response in 38? <sighs> These people just ain't getting it. I told him I was the resurrection. Yes, I healed the blind. Yes, I caused the lame to walk. Yes, I called uh, the, 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 the deaf to hear. I've, I've done all of these things. And it's not, let me, let me say this, and I'm going to sit down. But it's not what you have seen God do in the past. It does not dictate what he can do right now. As I said last week, he says, I am the I, he, he's the one that is, that was, and is to come. So, yes, God did great things for a lot of people in the past, but don't you think that you are exempt from being blessed by God here today? 
Just because I healed in the past and I was not here, when you think your situation died, does not mean I can speak a word. Remember, in the beginning was what? The word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word of God can make things happen that no man can ever imagine. That's why we say now unto him who is what? Able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can ask or think. Because I can have all of the faith I can believe until my face turn blue. But it's up to God to declare and decree a word on my situation. And when God decrees a word on your situation, it is about to happen. We're going to talk about him speaking that word on next week. But he says here, he grunts. He groans again in his spirit. Because understand that when you trust God, it is never too late. Somebody repeat that. It is never too late. God can show up on time, anytime. And so this is what makes him groan again. Because they don't realize that he is one with the Father. He says, if you know me, then you know the Father who sent me? And then in conclusion, y'all go ahead and stand because when you stand, I stop talking. He says, take ye, and this is what we're going to deal with on next week. Take ye away the stone. Remove what I have set free. And we all know that who the Lord sets free is free indeed. But there'll be one here today who would like to